begin with prayer. Brother Tom, would you lead us in prayer? Lord, we're thankful for the day you've given us today in your house with your people to fellowship with like minds and like hearts. We thank you, Lord, that uh, we've heard from your word today. We thank you that we've been able to sing together and worship uh, and just draw closer one to another as we draw closer to you. Uh, we thank you, Father, again for this time we have tonight uh, to meet once again. We do ask that your blessing would be upon it. We do pray for Brother Josh for the message that he brings tonight. That yes. you would, uh, just speak through him tonight that there would uh, essentially be two sermons tonight. The one we hear from Brother Josh's mouth and the other we hear from your Holy Spirit in our hearts, Lord. We just ask that you would guide and direct all that's done that it may be pleasing to you and bring glory to the name of Jesus Christ in whose name we ask it. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let's go ahead and sing a few more songs just to worship the Lord, to give Him praise tonight. 146. Song number 146. My Shepherd Will Supply my needs. Before we sing another song here, does there anyone who would like to praise the Lord? Just to thank Him for His goodness. I thank the Lord for God allowing us to be able to have uh, my son's home and Brittany with us uh, just for a couple days. And I'm just, just enjoying that time together. Uh, they came 500 miles just to get some marriage counseling. <laughs> They're committed, okay? So they got two out of six sessions done. And uh, they're eager and ready to pursue with the rest. And uh, then uh, we'll be continuing to work on that. We have a wedding coming up, Lord willing, in May. Okay? So, plenty of time. Okay? Uh, other praises. And let's take some from the kids as well. Can you thank the Lord for something special in your life that God's done for you? Okay? Hmm. Be thinking about it, okay? Yes, Brent. Well, I praise our great Lord for uh, the men and women and children that are in this service tonight because they know the priorities tonight. And uh, the Super Bowl halftime is not that great. Mm. Anyways, so I'm glad we decided to follow the Lord. It's been a little Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, Donna? I have a praise. Um, Friday, I'm um, Thank you. 
it's an opportunity. Yes, that is wonderful. Make sure you grab our church tracks, have a handful with you, to where you can just hand one out and say, you know what? Uh, God's given us a wonderful church, and we know how to make beef stew, and uh, we can fix flat tires. Amen. So someone was here this morning, and they went to pull out. Their husband is at work, and a young lady and the family were just stranded right here in the parking lot. And uh, so I was just so happy to see a bunch of our young men jumping right in, crawling underneath, jacking the car up, changing the tire, and, and what a blessing. And I said, praise the Lord that that was not a half a mile down the road where you would, everyone would have gone different directions, we wouldn't have seen you. So God's timing is perfect. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Natalie. Someone else is getting married too? Oh, okay. Let's go ahead and sing another song, 150, in loving kindness, Jesus came, in 150, he lifted me. It's a real blessing to have them. Okay? No, no. I suppose, Joe? I um, told you some time ago I started dusting off uh, the Spanish lessons, and I just thought, you know, we've got so many people around us, that, especially in this day and age, and you never know how the Lord is going to use some of those things. And as I was traveling to one of the airports out west, um, this young guy walked up behind me, tapped me on the shoulder, and um, asked me if I spoke Spanish. And uh, I just told him, you know, what amount I did, and that he was lost as a goose in a snowstorm. He had no idea where he was going, and he was trying to look at that ticket. And finally, I asked him. I said, "Hey, let me see your ticket," and and said, uh, "Oh, you're, you know, just follow me." So here's, I got the chance to talk to him a little bit. He's from Honduras, has a wife and kids back in Honduras. He's here to do some work and everything down in Florida. And so I just had him follow me down to the train and we was gonna take him to his gate. And, so, and about halfway through, I was, I said, you know what? The Lord just laid it on me. I just asked him, I said, have, have you eaten? Are you hungry? And. Uh, no telling how long it's been since he'd eaten, but he was very hungry. Mm -hmm. And so I said, hey, let me let me take you to McDonald's. And we sat at the table together and I prayed. And um, 
As soon as I started to pray, uh, he took off his cowboy hat long enough to pray and everything from that standpoint and then he was able to get down and take him to his gate and praise the Lord. I did every bit of that in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And I was Amen. like, thank you, Lord. Amen. And the little lady right there at the gate said, hey, take care of my friend there if you would. He has no idea what he's doing. And so I uh, told her the story. And she just said, she looked at me and she said, can I, can I give you a voucher for you doing that? And I said, for what? For just being so kind. And I said, well, no, ma'am, you can't. And I said, well, you know, and she goes, that is so sweet. And I said, no, ma'am, it's just what we all should be doing. You know, regardless of what his status is or anything else. It's just being kind. And so anyways, I just praise the Lord. Sometimes you think it doesn't Amen. make a difference. And got to lay somebody in your lap to say, you know what? It's just one at a time. It does make a difference. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Use us every day. Okay. Let's sing 168. <clears throat> o Lord, thou art my king. 168, he knoweth the way that I take. where God does take away, takes away some of our dreams, some of our expectations, and it feels like in its place are hurts. And why would God do that? Because He knows the way that I take. And within He creates a new heart, and He is going to take care. Whatever the loss, whatever the cost, we will draw nearer to Him. Great message. And the writer of that song had to have a personal walk with the Lord. And uh, he came up with a tune, but God put the message in his heart. So thank the Lord for that. Let's go ahead and take a moment for our offering. Let's ask God to bless this time. And I'll ask uh, Kim if she'll just play a song for us. Let's go ahead and uh, thank the Lord in this worship with, with giving. Lord, we love you. You know every step of the way that you have prescribed for us. And wherever we are, Whatever our past has been, you have a beautiful plan for us to move forward, to set up our, uh, lift us up out of the miry clay, to set our feet upon a rock and establish our going. And we pray that you would help us to stay on that right path, that we would walk with you, and Lord, that you would just bless. Father, thank you for all who are here tonight, and I pray that you would bless them. And as we worship you, I pray that you would receive these offerings from our hands in love, in Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Amen. Thank you for that beautiful song. I actually had on my notes right here, number 170 is our next song. So let's go ahead and sing that beautiful song, 170. And as we do, the children that are in the Bells Choir can be dismissed. And uh, let's go ahead and sing 170 as we stand and sing, By the Gentle Waters. Brother Josh is going to come and preach for us. He's one of our deacons, if you did not know that. And he is a great help in heading up things for foundations class, also with the soul winning on Saturday mornings. And what a blessing he is to our entire ministry. I'm looking forward to it, brother. And thank you for preaching when I was out of town. Amen. <clears throat> All right, good evening, everybody. I just want to praise the Lord for that message we heard this morning. Uh, pastor preached on how to evaluate people. And as I was sitting over there, the only thing I heard was how to judge the Sunday night preacher. <laughs> he talked about handling the Word of God. I was like, yeah, I better pray to make sure I handle the Word of God better. And I was, uh, but it was a good message, and I praise the Lord for that. And, uh, but I, uh, I also want to praise the Lord. I got a new Bible. So if I mess up tonight, it's because of the Bible. That's why. So don't judge me. So if you're evaluating, anyway, all right, so, uh, but anyway, he did talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, how to handle the Word of God and how we handle the Word of God, and, and uh, I, I, I love the Bible. I really do enjoy the, uh, the Word, and uh, when I hear people preach the Word of God correctly and the way the, the, way the Bible's meant to be taken, and I love hearing uh, preaching that's not out of context and I just, I, I love just, uh, I love God's Word. And uh, I like to teach the God's Word. I like to have the answer when somebody asks me about God's Word. In uh, 1 Peter 3.15 it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you, a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And we should always be ready to have an answer. So we're going to, that's a little bit about what I'm going to talk about tonight. But let's pray. Lord, we thank you for another good night. Thank you for your word. And um, thank you for understanding, for truth. And thank you, Lord, that we can trust you, that you're perfect and uncorruptible. And Lord, we're glad to have a God like you in our life, and we just want to ask that you would help us to understand your word, which we can't understand it, even understand it without you. So I pray that you would help us to understand your, the deep things of your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I'm talking about uh, tonight is, is being ready to give an answer. So there's two, two things that I want to talk about giving an answer for. One of them is eternal security, and another one is once we're saved, should we continue in sin? So, or can we continue in sin? Or what is the penalty of sin after we get saved? And if, if, I, was, like, if I was to come to you now, and I was to ask you to show me a verse from the Bible that shows that I'm going to go to heaven forever, that I have eternal security. 
I believe in the doctrine of eternal security. It's a thick doctrine throughout the Bible. And if I, so if I came to you, could you show me a verse? And if not, I want to challenge you tonight to grab a verse or two or ten so that if somebody ever challenges, challenges you and says, no, you can lose your salvation, can you, show, can you show them a verse? Because we're supposed to be skillful. We're supposed to be prepared and ready with the Bible. And uh, <clears throat> I was watching a video this week on YouTube. I watch those, uh, those little shorts, and the algorithm has me watching a lot of street evangelism. <clears throat> so this week, uh, there was, there's a guy I watch a lot with street evangelism. But this time, it was a, it was a vegan. And this vegan, he, he, came, he came up to the Christian lady, and he's challenging. The, some of y'all are smiling. I think you might have seen this video. But she, he, she was challenging the Christian lady uh, with this uh, verse that was so far out of context. And it was, it was just way out there about how veganism is biblical and, and we're not supposed to eat meat. Well, he challenged this Christian lady and it was a shame because she didn't have an answer for him. And he posted this video saying, see, like he, like he would want, even though he had, taken, like, like, he had taken this verse so far out of context. But it was a shame that, you know, there's been times where I haven't had a good answer. But we should always have a, uh, an answer for everything we, uh, for everything uh, that, we, that we're defending. The Bible says, seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There was more hope of a fool than of him. And uh, the Bible says that, you know, there's people that are going to be wise in their own conceit. That means they think they're so smart. That's what that really means. They think they're so smart. They have it all figured out. And that's how this vegan guy was. He had it all figured out. But the Bible also says in, uh, in Proverbs, it says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. So we have to have that answer. And uh, so that's one thing is I hope tonight that everybody can be a, just a little bit more prepared. I know a lot of you guys have verse after verse memorized that they deal with eternal security and, and, and the doctrine of sin and things like that. But I also want to provoke to love and good works. You know, if, if we have eternal security, can we just go around sinning? I'm hoping that a few of these reasons that I show you why we shouldn't sin will provoke you maybe to do more, to go further or try harder or maybe forsake and uh, repent of maybe a sin that maybe God will show you that maybe your work is, is working in your life or that you've been, been going through. So um, I'm hoping that maybe you'd be provoked a little bit and maybe that you'd be prepared a little bit from what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, eternal security. You know, um, 1 John 5, 13 says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You know, we have it, uh, we can know that we have currently eternal life. I have eternal life. It says that ye may know that ye have eternal life. John 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me uh, hath everlasting life. We have it. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. We passed from death into a new life. So we have it. We've already passed from death into life. John 10, verse 27 through 30 says, My sheep, excuse me, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So not only are we in Jesus' hand, he says, no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. We're in, we're in the Father's hand. Ephesians uh, uh, 1.13 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit. So not only do we have Jesus and the Father, but we have the Holy Spirit that's holding us. Uh, 1 Peter 1.5 says, Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We are kept by His power uh, Romans 8.38 says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature 
shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So not only are we kept by his power, but we're kept by his love because he loves us. Hebrews 13, 5 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be, with content, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We have everything because we have God. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So <clears throat> those who are saved already, we have eternal life. We've already passed from death into life. Jesus is keeping us saved. The Father is keeping us saved. The Holy Spirit is keeping us saved. We are kept by his power. We are kept by his love. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Just verse after verse in the Bible shows that we are eternally secure and you cannot lose your salvation. So we need to have a verse ready to, to show that doctrine. There's so many people out there and there's so many uh, other denominations or however you want to put it that teach that you can lose your salvation any verse that seem in any verse that i've seen in the bible that seems like you can lose your salvation it's taken out of context but we need to have we need to be able to give an uh, an, an answer excuse me you guys know that i used to live in a excuse me in a 22 story mansion True story. I lived in a 22-story mansion. I lived in there for three years. It was worth $4.5 billion. Over 5,000 people could sleep in this mansion. It had its own airport. It was really, I guess it was really more of like a yacht because it can travel around all, anywhere you want. All right, it was, it was an aircraft carrier. But it was my mansion, all right? <laughs> but while I was on the ship, I would witness to people. We often, you know, we'd have re religious discussions a lot. I was uh, every, not every, but as much time as I could when I wasn't working, I was in the Word. I was in the Bible studies that we had there. And uh, most people on that ship, we knew each other. Now, I say 5,000 people. It could, it could sleep 5,000 people, but when we weren't fully outfitted with our squadrons and with everybody when we weren't on our way to go out to deployment it was really more like less than a thousand people <coughs> so we all knew each other and uh everybody knew me as one of the religious guys there was very few i was the religious guy um one time we were uh, on the hangar hangar bay which is you got the flight deck and below that you got the hangar bay where they put all the and in the hangar bay they had set up a corral of vending machines and I was, I was sitting there, and I, and I started talking to this guy about the gospel. And he told me that you, you, could, you can lose yourself. He said, oh, you're one of those once saved, always saved guys. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, how come you don't just sin then? And I really didn't have a good answer to give to him at that point. He asked if I believe you could lose your salvation. He asked, why can't I just sin and do whatever I want? Well, the answer that I gave him is, first of all, when I got saved, I stopped wanting to sin. Wherefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Uh, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When I got saved, I repented. And with repentance, I realized that I had sinned against a holy God. It was the first time in my life where I was not just sorry that I had got caught, but it was I was sorry that I had sinned against the creator of the entire universe and I knew that I was going to be that that judgment was to come and that, that was when I repented well I changed I was born again God made me and turned me into a new creature and I did not want to sin anymore my new I had a new nature I still had my old flesh that desired sin but I had a new nature inside of me that wanted to be pleasing to God so first of all we won't want to sin after that but the answer that I've asked people over the years, just to kind of see, not like I was quizzing them or not like I was, what did the pastor do, evaluating them. But I wanted to see, a lot of times I'll ask people questions that I already know the answer to because I just want to see how they approach a question, uh, how they approach a, a thing. Because it can really tell you a lot about them, and I'm not trying to like put myself on, you know, above them or nothing, but I just, I just like the understanding. I, 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 one thing I like is... I ask for our wisdom, but I also ask for understanding. And, uh, but I'll ask people, 
why not sin after you get saved? And most of the time, this is the answer that I get. Turn to Romans chapter 6. I'm going to give seven reasons why you shouldn't sin after you get saved. This is, uh, this is not one of them, but this is what most people say. Romans chapter 6, verse number 1. <clears throat> what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may, be, may abound? God forbid. So most of the time when I ask people, should you sin after you get saved? They'll say, that's what they'll quote. It's like, God forbid. And they won't take it any, any deeper than that. But if you look at a few other verses, you know, the first reason I want to give you is that sin leads to bondage. Sin will, you're bound. Look at uh, verse number 12 here. It says, let not sin therefore reign. You know what kings do? Kings reign. You know what rulers do? Rulers reign. Let not therefore sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Look at verse number 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants ye are to whom ye obey? I don't want to be a servant of sin. John 8, 34 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Um, 2 Peter 2, 29 says, While they promised them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption. Corruption being a, a sin, almost a synonym for sin. Uh, I don't want to, sin to be my master. I don't want it to reign over me. Um, Psalms 19 verse 13 says, Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Uh, Psalms 119, 133 says, Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Dominion, it reigns, it rules. I want to be free. Uh, Proverbs 5, 23 says, His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. Cords of sin. He shall die without instruction in the greatness of his folly. He shall go astray. Proverbs 22, 5 says, Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. Froward is somebody who's going away from the right, God, the right direction. They're not going toward the right direction. They're going froward. To and fro are opposite. So when you're froward, you're not going the right direction. But thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. So you have bondage. Sin rules and reigns over you. And uh, I think I, I, I appreciate uh, Earl preaching last Sunday night. He preached on the woman at the well and sin hindering her and hindering the work of God. And uh, he talked about us being wells and us being... Uh, good or a blessing to other people and uh, we're not going to do that if we're stuck in the bondage of sin uh, but see that's just another layer yes sin binds you uh, how about, uh, another one is uh, you know we're supposed to love God first that's the greatest commandment is to love the Lord thy God and the second is like unto it to love thy neighbor as thyself you know, the root of all evil is the love of money. And the love of money, it says, but godliness with contentment is great. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, 8 says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us, therewith, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts. Which, draw men, which drown men in destruction and perdition, perdition, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So loving money instead of loving God. So the first reason that, I'm talk, that, I, that, I, that I went through is sin binds you. Sin and snaring and having rain over us is a doctrine is glutted throughout the entire Bible about sin being a snare. It's in the Old Testament. It's in Proverbs. It's in the New Testament. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's all the way through. Uh, 
So giving into sin, you become bound, you become enslaved, and you become ensnared. You know, uh, I was on a keto diet for a little while. And when I first started that diet, I wanted, it, it, it's good because you get to eat bacon. Uh, I like avocados. You get to eat avocados. You get to eat steak, a lot of, you know, uh, ground beef, burgers. But you, when you first start, you get these cravings. Like the first thing I noticed was garlic bread. I really was craving uh, Cheetos, right, and, and, and garlic bread, and cookies, and anything with carbs, pizza, garlic bread, like all this stuff, over and over and over. But after a while, you know, of, of not giving in to that, the desire to have that faded to where I did not want it anymore. When you feed sin, the appetite for it becomes stronger. Uh, we get used to it, and then we become ensnared by it. Little sins will lead to big sins. So you start off and you feed that appetite. You have that one drink, and it leads to more drinks. And next thing you know, you're killing somebody because you're drunk driving. With a domestic, or you're, you're beating your wife, leaving your, your, your family. You got liver disease and you're bound. Sin binds us. You look at that one picture and then you have that appetite. And that one picture you looked at that you weren't supposed to look at, it comes back into your brain and back into your brain. That's why you should never, never give in to the little first sin. Say, it's not going to be all right just to do it just this one time. It's not okay because it's going to come back to you and it's going to feed that appetite, and it's going to ensnare you. Or we say like uh, with a, a, I want to say man and woman, more like a young man, a young woman, that just that one little kiss, next thing you know you're pregnant, out of wedlock, starts with that one puff of smoke, next thing you know you have to go have a cigarette every one hour, 15 minutes, whatever it is. My grandparents, they would go like this. They, would, they, they both died. Well, my grandpa died of lung cancer. My grandma, she died of some other kind of cancer. But she'd have a cigarette in her mouth. She wouldn't even take it out of her mouth. My grandpa wouldn't take it out of his mouth. He, he wouldn't even dip the ashes. He'd just go, Phew! just shoot the ashes off. And then when it, when it got done with a cigarette, he'd put a new one in his mouth, take the old cigarette, and then light, light the old cigarette with that one. Couldn't give it up. My grandma used to chew tobacco, too. She would chew tobacco while she was uh, doing the dishes, but because she couldn't smoke while she, was chewing, while she was doing the dishes. So <laughs> all I'm saying is she was snared, bound. You know, I, I don't want to be under the power of anything. You know, when you, that's why people say, oh, well, the Bible doesn't say that you can't smoke. Yeah, but you're under the power of something. And I only want to be under the power of the Lord. I want to be free. I want to not have any kind of snares or anything holding me back. That's why, uh, you know, I, 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 I say you shouldn't smoke. You know, I lived, uh, I lived in downtown San Diego for a little while. I prayed about, really, really prayed about where I was going to live. And I lived in the heart of downtown. I would park my car, and when I was walking back from my car to my apartment, you always have to park blocks away because it's a big city. I'd always be able to pass out three, four, five tracks on the way home. And I did that on purpose because I wanted to be around people and I wanted to be around uh, to be able to give out the word. But someone who has, people would always say, well, how can you do that? How can you be around in that environment? Well, it wasn't really that bad. But it's kind of like a, somebody who tries, who has a problem with alcoholism. They can't go to a bar and preach. I don't have the temptation of alcohol. I can go to a bar and preach, and I won't be tempted. Um, because what I'm trying to say is that there's a little bit of freedom there. Because if you give in to that sin, you start putting yourself into boxes where you can't go and things you can't do. You start to lose opportunities. Uh, there's qualifications to be a pastor. You can forfeit that. There's qualifications to be a deacon, and you can forfeit that. Uh, so 
I don't want to be enslaved, enslaved like that to things, to uh, drugs, alcohol, um, looking at bad stuff. But there are other ways to be enslaved, ensnared and enslaved in sin. You know, unforgiveness is a sin that brings spiritual bondage. Um, and when you stand praying, forgive if you have ought against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. You know, he's snared in unforgiveness. You know, when you don't forgive somebody, what happens is, is you start to resent them. And then when you resent somebody, you retaliate against them. And when you start retaliating against each other, then that leads to, to bitterness and hate. And we're supposed to be... The greatest commandment is supposed to love. So if you have unforgiveness, it's, it's, it's a tough one. I mean, sometimes it's really hard to forgive people. We've got to have forgiveness and ask God to help us with that. You know, that's what grace is. That's God's power working through you. you ask God for grace. Oh, you know, walking in, the, walking in the world's ways leads to spiritual bondage. Um, you can't go two directions at the same time. You're either going God's way or you're going the world's way. Uh, you know, Psalm 1, it says, Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So we're either going to walk in the counsel of the ungodly, we're going to walk in the world's ways, or we're going to meditate in the word and walk in God's ways. And walking in God's ways, you're yielding to God, you're not yielding to the world. The spiritual bondage is taken away. Uh, you wanna, we don't want to be trapped in the path of going the world's ways, we want to be in the path of righteousness in God's ways. Uh, you know, believing lies is also a way to have uh, spiritual bondage. You know, um, not having faith keeps you from doing what God really has planned for you. The fear of man bringeth a snare. The bondage, snare. Fear of man bringeth a snare. Uh, believing lies... Um, Not having a biblical worldview and not meditating on God's ways. Things like some people will waste their life on climate change. When God has promised that he's going to, the, the, until, the, until he comes back, it's going to be summer and winter, springtime and harvest. Uh, some people will waste their meditations uh, the climate change fear will lead to bondage. You know, uh, one of the shows I, re I really like to watch is Doomsday Preppers. Anybody else watch that show? I love that show, but I'm not going to be a prepper because that's not my purpose in life. I, I mean, they, 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 some of them guys come up with some really good ideas, but I, I don't, I don't want to get into it. I could go on and on about it, but some of those guys are, they, they got good brains on them, but, but, if you focus on that, you're not going to be doing what you're supposed to, to do. God has a purpose and a direction that we're supposed to be walking. And uh, God wants us to be free to do, to do the right things. Um, if you don't do right and you're not walking in the right direction, you're not going to get to the next level. Like, think about uh, Dan Tesson. He was a missionary. You think he's going to go from sitting in the pew... Doing the wrong, going the wrong way, doing the wrong direction to becoming a missionary. It's not going to happen. You're not going to become a missionary if you're not a missionary in Clarksville, Tennessee. It's steps. Look at David. He didn't go just kill a giant. First he killed a lion. First he killed a bear. Then God used him to kill the giant. We have to be doing what we know to do in that next step, that next thing that you know that God has for you. If you're not reading your Bible, that's reading your Bible. If you're not praying, God wants you to pray. You need to be praying. Uh, we need to be fasting. Uh, we need to be telling people about Jesus. We need to be out there. See, so we don't want to be bound. And um, I didn't think that was going to take that long. But um, that was one reason <laughs> that you should not sin after you get saved. 
There's seven, all right? Another reason is you reap what you sow. I mean, how about that? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Any of you guys, when you were kids, you know, you're, 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 your parents are getting ready to give you a spanking. I know I'm not the only one. You go to the other room, take that book, shove it down your backside. I don't know. Let me uh, see. How many of you guys did the book method? And uh, how many of you guys did the multiple layer method? Okay, my kids tried both. I tried both. But anyway, God is not mocked. You know, that's like, he's going to see right through all that. Trying to get away with something. You can't get away with anything with God. You will reap what you sow. And the good news is that we also reap good things if we do good things. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom, into your bosom, for with the same measure that ye meet, with all it shall be measured unto you again. You give, it shall be given unto you. Go around doing good things. Good things will come back to you. You will, you will reap what you sow. So we need to make sure that we don't sin because of spiritual bondage, but also because you reap what you sow. But how about this one? Third reason, you will lose rewards in heaven. That's an that's a eternal, eternal reward that we have. Let's look at 1 Corinthians. I'm kind of running out of time here. I've got um, not that much longer, but we'll... 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This has two reasons right here, 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. Now, the context of 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 is Paul's talking about building people, edifying the church, that's why he's talking about when he says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos. He's saying, uh, he's got these different groups of guys, and each one's building people a different, a different way. But he's saying, well, you know, what are you doing to teach somebody else? What are you doing to edify somebody else? Well, let's look at verse number 13. When, uh, let me get there. Uh, Verse 12, now if any man build upon his foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work shall abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. So we can have a reward. Uh, you know, 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to be judged not for salvation, but according to our works. That's what the judgment seat of Christ is all about, being judged according to our works. Um, Matthew 5.11 says, uh, 5.12 says, Rejoice and be glad, exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. It's talking about if you're persecuted. Great is your reward in heaven. You can have rewards in heaven. We get rewards for preaching the gospel. The Bible says, Ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The Bible says that, we are heirs, heirs of God and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him. Heirs get an inheritance or a reward. Or a reward. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3, 4, it says, To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. We have an inheritance. We have something great waiting for us. And when we sin, we, not only when we do wrong, but when we fail to do right, we lose those rewards. But when we do right, we gain those rewards. So that's uh, reason number one was uh, spiritual bondage. Reason number two is you reap what you sow. Uh, reason number three is you lose rewards in heaven when you sin. Uh, reason number four is you live a shorter life. Now, the first time uh, I, I read this verse, I was like, oh, that, does, that seems like maybe, seems a little weird. But, you know, I found, this is just what I found, 21 different passages in the Bible, Old, New Testament, and uh, Proverbs and Psalms, and they talk about when we keep God's commandments, we live longer. If anybody wants those, I got those right here. But, you know, <clears throat> right here we're in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse number 15. So we talked, we just read verse 14, he shall receive a reward. Now verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. 
It's eternal security right there. Yet so as by fire. Now look at the next verse. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. Our body is God's temple. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Sorry, that's my alarm to be quiet. Sermon's over. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We're only on number four. I'll, I'll be real quick. But um, so that, that right there, you know, if we defile God's temple, him shall God destroy, you know. But there's verse after verse in the Bible. The first commandment with promise is honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. And that, that uh, it says that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Uh, Proverbs 3, 1 says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandment for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Uh, Proverbs 10, 27, The fear of the Lord prolongeth days. I'll just read a couple more. Uh, Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be many, it says in Proverbs 4, 10. And I got 21 of them listed here, if you guys are interested. I'll send it to you. But also, the Bible talks about, you know, when I'm still talking about long life, he promised the children of Israel to keep them safe from certain diseases by avoiding sin. So, I'm, so that's, uh, that's reason number four. You live a shorter life if you sin. Reason number five, you hurt the people that follow you. We're supposed to be examples. And by us being a bad example, what we're, what we're causing is other people that are following us, our family members, our coworkers, uh, our ch other church members, to stumble. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. But, you know, some people say, well, nobody saw me do that. Nobody saw me when I was looking at that thing on the Internet. It doesn't hurt anybody. But it does hurt other people. Because when you're looking at those things, what happens is you're not in the spirit. Those secret sins, you're not walking in the spirit. And those secret sins, what, they, what, they, what, what it causes you to, is, is to not be, like Brother Earl was talking, that well. You're not going to be a person who can put out something good, who can be a blessing to other people. Because when we're not walking in the spirit, we're not getting the fruit of the spirit. We're not having love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, goodness, faith, long-suffering. I think that's all of them. But we need to have those things. We need to have that fruit. And those secret sins keep us from having that fruit. So number five, we hurt those that follow us. Number six, your prayers are hindered. Um, I want my prayers answered. I love getting answered prayers. It's such a, an amazing thing to get. You know, I prayed. I, I just think about this. I don't know why this one popped in my head. But there was this guy, and he didn't want us to pray for him. He was going on a trip. Uh, the, mil the, the Navy was sending him to training somewhere. And I said, let's pray, you know, before you leave. Let's, let's get down and let's, you know, pray that God will keep you safe. And he's like, no, I'm going to go home. I'm tired. I was like, no, we need to pray. And we got on our knees and prayed, me and, uh, and a few other guys, and we all prayed for him. And while he was on that trip, the bus that he was in crashed. The guy that was in front of him died. The guy that was next to him died. And the guy that was behind him died. He broke his arm. Uh, anyway, prayer. Answer prayer. Uh, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Sinful lust calls us to pray with the wrong motive. When you, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. Um, there's other verses, but... And the last one, so not only does it hurt other people, causes our prayers not to get answered, but the worst one of all is that when we sin, we grieve the Holy Spirit. That's what we're created to do, is to fellowship with God. And when we sin, we break that fellowship. Look what Adam did when he sinned. He hid. Uh, I, you know, I really don't feel like coming, you know, I come, you, the Bible says come boldly. We're going to find grace. And, uh, but 
I try to like avoid God when I'm doing wrong. I don't know if I'm the only one. I want to be close to God. I feel, I feel, uh, but the Bible says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. I want to, I want to love God. Uh, those things, it says in Philippians 4, 9, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. So do the right things and the God of peace shall be with you. Uh, 1 John 1, 6 through 7 says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Fellowship with him is what it's talking about. That's the context. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. That's fellowship with God. Not talking about fellowship with each other. The context is fellowship with God. Amos 3, 3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Um. So those seven reasons why we shouldn't sin after we get saved. We have eternal security. If you don't have a verse, I want to challenge you today, find a verse, memorize it, at least be able to turn to it in the Bible. I, I like to have multiple verses for, for the things that I believe that I think there are that important. Um, eternal security, but reasons why you shouldn't sin after you get saved. Number one, spiritual bondage. Uh, number two is... I say number two was we you reap what you sow number three you lose rewards in heaven Uh, number four you live a shorter life number five we hurt the people that follow us number six our prayers are hindered and number seven is we break fellowship with God so I don't know how the Lord maybe spoke to you maybe something in your life that you say man I could maybe I could do that a little bit better and I don't want anybody to leave here thinking, oh, I'm so horrible, I'm so terrible, or whatever. You know, God has, he wants us to come boldly to him, to find grace to help in time of need. You know, God wants, you know, it, God is not done. He will never be done with you. God always wants every single one of us to keep going forward. It's, it's the next step. Make the next right decision. Don't look back at the past, but say, I'm going to do the next thing. I'm going to do that right. Moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day, make the right decision. And if you mess up, move forward. God has great things planned for you. God has rewards. God has things that he wants us to, to, to reap. So uh, hopefully that was a blessing, the understanding of, you know, what, why we shouldn't sin after we get saved. Uh, pray that the Lord will use that in whatever way. Maybe it's just so that you're a better, what was pastor preaching on this morning? That you're, uh, you handle the word of God correctly. I had to write that down when he, when he said that, how do they handle the word of God? Maybe, maybe one of those reasons will help you to handle the word of God a little bit better. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and we thank you for understanding that you give us. And I, I, I really desire to do better, Lord. I want to be better, mess up so many times. I know so many here, Lord, they are truly trying to be the best and they want to do more. Help us all, Lord, to have the desire to do more because it's you that wills, works in us to will and to do of your good pleasure. We're nothing without you, Lord. We pray for your help. In Jesus' name, amen.